Well, welcome everyone. Hopefully I've left enough time there technologically to allow everyone to log on. Um, we think we've got 100 or so in the audience for this webinar that the Centre for Social Justice is hosting today at the Tory party virtual conference on ending rough sleeping in England. And we've got a lot to get through in this um, just less than an hour and we've got some great panellists as well. I'd like to just start this by thanking the sponsor, which is the Waits Family Enterprise Trust. And we've got Tim Waits as one of our contributors today. Um, but equally, thank you to all of our panellists for appearing. Um, we're sorry we can't do this in person and we have to go through the virtual motions, but hopefully the connectivity won't let us down. We'll all be in shop. We won't be sort of doing robotics as we speak and everything should go digitally as smoothly as possible. Um, so without any further ado, obviously this is an important topic, not least in light of the post-COVID era, that idea of people being told to stay at home obviously applied to the vast majority, but what about the minority of people for whom they have nowhere to call home? And the swift government action that was taken to take rough sleepers off the streets and house them in the intervening period during lockdown, obviously has sent a message out there that there is a way to end rough sleeping. Um, local authorities being helped with huge amounts of government cash to do that, but is that situation sustainable? Does that mean that it's going to be even more achievable for the government to meet that aim of ending rough sleeping by 2024? Well, we're hopefully going to discuss and get the answers to those questions over the course of the next hour. Uh, we have got the House Secretary, Robert Jenrick, joining us. Um, he's tied up doing a media round following Boris Johnson's speech just now. So he's going to be tied up until 1.25. But in the meantime, we've got some great speakers. So let me introduce them to you now. We have Sally Ann Hart, who is the MP for Hastings and Rye. She won the seat when Amber Rudd stood down in 2019. Uh, welcome, Sally Ann. We've also got Tim Waits, who I mentioned earlier. Um, he's the director of the Waits Group, which for those who don't know, it's one of the um, UK's leading privately owned construction and property development companies at a turnover of 1.63 billion. So they know what they're doing. Um, and welcome to Tim. We've also got Louise Green here, who is the CEO of Brick, which is a charity that will be familiar to many of you because it does such great work with the homeless. And we've got our own CSJ's, the CSJ's own um, head of housing, Joe Shalam, who shall be giving us the CSJ's perspective on this crisis, um, which as ever is ongoing. Um, and as I said, Mr. Jenrick will be joining us shortly. And how this is going to work, it's quite simple. All of the speakers um, will have about two to three minutes just to present their case in answer to the question, what are the next steps to ending rough sleeping in England? And then we'll open it out to the floor. Um, audience members, you can take part in the Q&A and I'm happy to put any of your questions to all or some of the panelists, just make that clear to me. Um, but let's get this started. Uh, what are the steps to ending rough sleeping in England? Let's start with Sally Ann, please. Thank you, Camilla. So, um... Good, good afternoon. It's afternoon to everyone. So uh, I just want to say that the Homeless Reduction Act that's been brought in by this government has been crucial in reducing homelessness and the government's targeted schemes such as the Rough Sleeping Initiative has gone a long way in reducing rough sleeping. I'm a proponent of housing first with wraparound care for people with multiple complex needs. And um, looking at the personal drivers at rough sleeping for rough sleeping is important. And we do need to consider how we can prevent homelessness before it begins. So I think we need to focus on um, support, early intervention and prevention for vulnerable and at risk families. And the Conservative Party does have its manifesto to strengthen families, strengthening and supporting families is a social justice priority which requires a high level of government, cross-governmental, um, departmental working. Often personal drivers for rough sleeping or homelessness are embedded in the neglect or abuse they experienced in childhood. And a large percentage of homelessness comes from people who've been in the care system. And therefore, early intervention and prevention, getting children and families right, will help prevent the levels of young people entering into the adult services and homelessness system. So I think one in four young care leavers find themselves homeless once they reach 18 and 14% are sleeping rough. So we have to stop this from happening. Thank you very much indeed, Sally-Ann, for those opening remarks. 
Um, let's now hear from Tim Waits, who is the director of the Waits Group. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you so much, Camilla, and thanks, Sally Ann, for that, that introduction, which I thought was, was excellent. So I'm here in my capacity uh, as trustee of the Waits Family Enterprise Trust. And the Enterprise Trust is a keen promoter of thought leadership in housing and homelessness. And this links to our connection to the CSJ, where who we think have an excellent programme of really practical and thought through work. So we're really pleased to be supporting you. So as you said, Camilla, in my day job, I'm a director and shareholder of Waits. I lead for the, sh the family on housing and about a billion of our turnover is housing related. So we therefore have a great interest in housing, both as a major part of our business, but also because we really recognize the critical part housing plays in enabling people to lead stable, happy and productive lives. So in terms of this debate, I'd just like to draw on a couple of quite specific things. First of all, I'd like to add to what's been said about the government response to the pandemic. I think the decisive action that was taken to take rough sleepers off the seat was really, really good. And studies have shown that we are in the top two or three in Europe in that regard. So we did really well. So it's encouraging the will and a budget that solutions can be found. So I'd like to make that point. And then secondly, I'd like to draw on some work that the Family Enterprise Trust recently did with St Mungo's. And this is just a bit of a narrow approach, but I think indicative, in, is indicative of what's, what's going on. And it shone a light on an area not widely understood, which is the situation that many employed transient workers find themselves in, in industries such as construction, the care sector and hospitality. They find themselves in a very precarious place, often on the, on the edge of homelessness. They face challenges of low pay, unstable hours, and being geographically a long way from their place of work. And this study really showed what we probably thought we knew, but it really showed it properly. The transient workers can, can get caught in a trap of continuing taking insecure roles and not being able to stabilize their work and homes. Great personal impact on them as people and a great impact on the possibility of them finding themselves homeless. We did a follow-up questionnaire post-COVID or during COVID and we can see that not surprisingly this already difficult situation for transient workers is, is exacerbated. So Mungo has had a few recommendations that asking the government to provide more financial support and flexibility around benefits, something like getting the, the balance right on the benefits and making people stand on their own two feet. In the end, they're saying you cannot fix this for free. And they're also saying to us employers, recognize if your employees are in homelessness difficulties and where to guide them for help. So in conclusion, really, this work by St Mungo's is further evidence we mustn't forget they're nearly homeless. And that rough sleeping, for rough sleeping to be completely beaten, we have to catch people before they find that rough sleeping is their only choice. Thanks very much for that, Tim. Yeah, I'm sure we'll discuss that later in the Q&A, this notion of perhaps the idea of the rough sleeper being slightly cliched and not quite representative of all of the people involved in this issue. Um, and actually, that brings us nicely on to Louise Green, who will be the expert on exactly who is suffering as a result of rough sleeping right now and what the government and others can do about it. Louise, thank you. Please take it away. Right, thank you. And thanks, uh, Joe, for having me today. Um, <clears throat> listening to both Sally and Tim completely echo everything they're saying. Um, I've, I've been in the homeless sector since 1998, so I've seen a lot of initiatives come and go. Um, no Second Night Out, Meme, um, ABEN, all of which um, had elements of great success, but never managed to completely uh, abolish rough sleeping altogether. I think recognition has to be given for the response to get everyone in when COVID hit. I think that was a great government initiative and I, I say hats off um, to, to what they've done. Um, and not only did they provide, make sure that people had some place to stay, people had their own place to stay, which I think was a big, huge, um, a big, huge improvement than asking people to share uh, and have somebody right next to you that you have no idea. And you know, we as a we as a charity are looking at that as our provision to see what we can do to make uh, the sleeping arrangements better for people, and so that they have more opportunities to come in. Um, the we um, like I said, we, we are looking for a sleeping solution. Um, when I was faced uh, with this question about how do we end rough sleeping, you know, forever, I reflected on this for, for several days, really, trying to work out what is the actual answer. And as I can imagine, many people probably have try and contemplate this question. Um, is there actually an answer or is there actually an easy answer? My honest reflection is that the answer does not lie in four walls and a roof alone. I think Housing First is a great uh, initiative. Um, and I just think that there has to be, like Sally said before, more wraparound support. 
people do not fit nicely into one specific service or one specific initiative. People are complex and the reasons for rough sleeping are different. Therefore, one size does not fit all. I feel initiatives need to be locally led with good practice initiatives at the forefront of any procurement. Acknowledging that health, the local authority and adult social services all play a part in the end to rough sleeping. I think there can be more done where everybody's working together um, and looking for the same outcome and that, that you know, makes for a seamless service. Um, I think the voluntary sector should be given uh, more importance in delivering their services um, and, and be faced as that we are just as, just as able-bodied as any statutory service to provide that to rough sleepers. Um, there's a lot of experience in local charities and, and you know, that, that's embedded in the communities. And I think we should, we should probably try and draw that out more than what we maybe do right now. I think um, the offer needs to be holistic um, and needs to be a combination of national and local responses. Housing needs to be made available, appropriate support and opportunities need to be provided. And ultimately we need to see rough sleepers as the people they are. They have aspirations, they are individuals and homelessness should not be their identity. But instead they should be valued, provided with real true opportunities and they should take the lead on their own pathway. Each rough sleeper should be provided with the personal transition service, which is unique to them and it's spearheaded by them. There needs to be opportunities for training, work experience, volunteering and mentoring. I don't think it's a fix it by tomorrow solution, but I do think it's a fix it forever solution. Um, I think the other thing I would like to point out is that um, we can give people four, uh, four walls and a roof and people will exist in it. Um, I want to go one better. I, I want to put another challenge out there that we don't ask people to exist. We ask people to thrive. Um, and I just want to thank you again for giving me the opportunity to have a say today. Thanks very much, Louise. You reminded me there actually of a quote by Meghan Markle about people thriving as opposed to just existing. Um, and with that in mind, um, let's have, hand over to Joe, who can hopefully from the CSJ, Joe Shalam, who's um, the Director of Housing, who can perhaps put this whole debate into some sense of context as well as presenting the CSJ's position, Joe. Sure, well, thanks very much, Camilla. And um, thanks also to all the other panelists for being with the CSJ today. Uh, as Camilla said, I'm Joe Shalom. I'm the Head of Housing at the CSJ. Uh, and I'll keep this brief because I know there, there are people waiting to ask questions in the, um, in the Q&A box. Please do add those. Uh, and we'll be hearing from the Secretary of State shortly. But I just had a couple of things on next steps from the CSJ's perspective, both in terms of the immediate and the medium term policy response. And the first, I suppose, is something you rarely hear from policy organisations, and that's to ask the government to keep doing what it's doing. Um, but the, the pragmatism, the funding, but actually above all the political will to get things done on rough sleeping, particularly at the start of the crisis, uh, we think really needs to be maintained. You know, we know that this sleeves rolled up approach um, saved literally hundreds of lives. And so local authorities and charities um, should be continued to be supported, particularly as we get closer to winter uh, with the emergency accommodation approach uh, that's worked so well to get people off the streets. You know, and everybody in um, 2.0 may well be needed as we get to the crunch of winter. But the second key point, I think, is about sustaining the gains that have been made. And we know from uh, an overwhelming body of, of international evidence and new evidence seen by the CSJ that, you know, while it won't be right for everyone, for those dealing with the most complex and acute challenges, housing first um, is the model most effective at sustaining tenancies. And we've got some great regional Housing First pilots underway. Um, but in the years to come, we'd like to see the government's Next Steps programme evolve into what we see as its natural successor. And that's a National Housing First programme. And this would provide rough sleepers and support staff with the permanence needed to sustain tenancies and truly turn lives around. And just to come on to my final point, this is really about prevention. And thinking well beyond um, housing policy alone, I think we really need to get to grips with some of the deeper issues in our society, things like family breakdown, things like addiction, poor mental health, particularly at a young age. And we need to intervene much earlier as we know that these things are so closely linked to rough sleeping in later life. And um, the government did have a review underway on some of the longer term root causes of rough sleeping. I, I fear this may have been um, sidelined by COVID quite understandably like so much else, but I think it's really worth picking up that agenda again as soon as possible. And equally, you know, we know from 
the government's recent review of its excellent um, Homelessness Reduction Act, that councils are telling us loudly and clearly that the lack of available affordable, affordable housing is a primary barrier to preventing homelessness at the earlier stage where we can intervene. And so I've been banging this drum for a while now, but I think that we really need to reclaim the debate around social housing um, and actually a bold conservative um, social housing agenda will be critical to ending rough sleeping for good, as has been achieved in other countries, um, and, and I dare say also much more. Uh, very luckily, the, the CSJ has two pieces of work underway, both on scaling up housing first in England and the future of social housing, and we are very excited to share findings soon. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. Now, I'm conscious just of timing that we've obviously got 10 minutes until Robert Jenrick is joining. So I think what we'll do is I'll just ask a couple of questions and then bring in some of these Q&A from the audience, which are great questions. Although I don't want to be asking great questions without the Secretary of State here to answer some of them. So forgive me if I hold a couple of them back. Just initially, Joe, can you just explain what Housing First is in a nutshell? I know the clues in the name, but for those who aren't familiar with this particular model, could you just run it, run it by us, please? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, Housing First, I think um, it's, it's, I suppose, yeah, the clue is in the name in, in so far as it puts um, a conventional model of homelessness um, reduction on its head by saying, no, the best way of really turning someone's life around where they are suffering with the most um, kind of acute social um, mental health addiction problems is it's not to put them in a in, in short-term accommodation and say well you know we'll sort, sort out those problems and we'll make you housing ready but actually to say no we'll put you in a permanent home of your own very few conditions attached other than actually wanting that tenancy um, and we will give you the support you need in a very intensive way but as you need it and as you feel that you need it and so what you do really effectively with Housing First is build up the trust to engage people who, um, you know, to, to put it bluntly, are, are causing damage to themselves, potentially, um, you know, draining social uh, support services, costing lots of money for the state and actually saying we're going to work with you to turn your life around. But that does require, um, again, returning to the clue in the name, you need the home there in the first place to do the Housing First uh, model. So I hope I've given a bit of a yeah, explanation sounds, sounds overly generous, doesn't it, that model? But at the same time, when you're saying that people who have a roof over their heads may not be predisposed to as many mental and physical health problems, or indeed they may then find work because they've got a fixed abode, because everybody needs that um, address in order to make applications and others, you know, everything follows. And therefore it probably in the end end up saving the state money. That's the argument, presumably economically, Joe. I think that's it exactly. And I, I mean, I would emphasize that, you know, we're not saying it's a one size fit all, uh, fits all approach here. Housing first, um, we're quite clear, is, is the most appropriate measure for those, um, you know, the most kind of complex, most difficult end of the spectrum. There are people, I think, as Tim Waits um, spoke about that, you know, reveal that the, the crisis has revealed people are nearly homeless. They might require a more sort of critical time intervention um, to help get them back on their feet. But for those who've been rough sleeping for a while and really suffering, housing first does work. And we know that. Got it. Um, Sally Ann, you spoke about um, prevention as well as cure. And there's an interesting question here from Pippa Hockton, who's in the audience, asking Do panelists agree that cuts in mental health care need to be reversed to prevent rough sleeping? Um, Sally Ann, could you come in on that question, please? Yes, um, absolutely. And I, and I think that, you know, I know that the government has invested in mental health, but I think following coronavirus, it's very clear. I mean, I get emails from constituents that people are suffering mental health issues that have that have actually um, exacerbated through coronavirus. And I think it is something we really need to, to focus on. And I think, um, going back to Joe, is that... Um, Often, if you've got a safe, secure housing um, as a sort of basis, you can then treat your mental health issues, whether it's to do with um, substance misuse or just mental health issues that have developed over time, which have been exacerbated by homelessness. And I think that there is an issue of what it's the chicken and egg. Does the mental health issues cause you to be homeless or does the homelessness cause you to have mental health issues? So I think when we're looking at mental health, I think actually we need to invest more in mental health going forward because it's very clear to me and a lot of MPs over coronavirus that mental health issues have increased over the past few months. 
Um, Louise, let's bring you in there because I suppose the common perception would be that a great many rough sleepers do have mental health issues. Is that the actual case? Is that borne out in the statistics? From our from our local um, experience that we have, yes, I would say that the, a lot of rough sleepers do present with mental health um, uh, issues. Um, again, and you you're you're always fighting that battle about dual diagnosis, aren't you? You know what I mean? Did, are, are they addicted to drugs because of their mental health or is their mental health poor because they're addicted to drugs? And I think that's something that we've got to try and overcome as well because that plays a big part in rough sleeping. So presumably this um, legacy of sort of closing down mental health care institutions, many of which seemed far too Victorian and in some cases barbaric, so we accept that, but replacing it with sort of daycare isn't particularly useful to those who may need residential treatment. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Um, there, needs, there needs to be that provision. And like I said before, the, the one size doesn't fit all in, in all aspects of what we're trying to do with, with when we're working with rough sleepers is that there's got to be different kind of provisions available. And you are right. If, they, if they've got nowhere to stay at night, how is that going to uh, give them the ability to do, you know, to come to the day centre um, and, and, and give a really good um, productive input into their session if they're going to be worried that night about where they're going to sleep so you, you definitely have to have you've got to provide that relief um and that that is the first instance where housing first does fit in somebody needs to be able to have somewhere to lay their head down at night and then everything else on the back of that can start to work Let's talk about the availability of bricks and mortar. And obviously this is something that I'll be asking the Secretary of State about when it comes to the government's commitment to building social housing and what accommodation that takes. Because of course there are concerns that even with new announcements of new social housing, it's still not affordable to those who are rough sleeping, right? So we'll get onto that with him. But Patrick Fowler in the audience has asked, do the panel believe the building of more accessible and affordable housing is an investment rather than a cost to society? Tim, can you take that one because obviously you're in the house building business. Yes I'm very happy to. I mean as you may imagine you know we I think one of our as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk we have this philosophy in our group about good housing is good for people. So we take it behind housing first as a concept. Therefore obviously in terms of the provision of good quality affordable housing where people need to live is, is an absolute building block for leading good lives. So the answer for me is yes, we've got to bite the bullet and increase the provision of housing that is affordable for people where they want to live. I mean, have the, have the government been building enough? I don't know, Joe. how much affordable housing is being built per year? I'm, my understanding is it's sort of 20 to 30,000 when it might need to be in the hundreds of thousands. Well, I think, I mean, the, 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 the dilemma here and the issue here is that when we talk about affordable housing, it's often um, something that's discussed in, in policy circles that's so far from... Uh, what, what people on modest incomes might consider to be affordable housing. And actually there are a whole range of, whole spectrum of different kind of affordable housing products, as it were. I mean, when we're talking about people sleeping rough, you know, likely to be um, at the very lowest end of the income distribution, what I think we're really talking about with affordable housing uh, is, is homes for social rent. And that's homes that are tied to um, local incomes. And it's a specific affordable housing tenure um, which is in short supply and actually we're only building something like six and a half thousand every year at the moment and we're quite reliant on the private market to deliver social rented homes and so we find ourselves in a very uh, a very worrying context where house building on the whole is likely to stall in the midst of um, this kind of economic crisis recession and so while the government has been very bold in announcing you know lots of new money for affordable housing I think the CSJ would argue that we really need to make sure that social uh, rent as a particular tenure comes forward even more um, strongly in, in the years ahead. If we are going to end rough sleeping, if we are going to meet this ambition, that's what we need to do to sustain it. Brilliant. I think that answers Alistair Harper's um, comment there because he's talking about social homes and also talking about the fact that the majority of uh, Brits, I think 63% claim to have no savings at all. A lot of these government initiatives are obviously dependent on a deposit, often provided by the so-called bank of mum and dad. Um, and um, doesn't really touch the size of people who literally haven't got a penny to rub together. Um, so I think we've answered that one. There's a couple of good questions here that I do want to wait for Robert Jenrick. Um, Carolyn's asking about this target of 
um, solving this issue by 2024? And is it is it achievable, frankly, in the post COVID era? But I think that's something that we want Generic to address. Um, Salim here is asking about interest only mortgage redemptions and when there's a significant shortfall, government backed lenders. This is another problem, of course. Is that it, um, we talked earlier about this idea of the cliched rough sleeper and it will be that image of somebody lying in a doorway you know drinking out of a paper bag um louise um and indeed tim's talked about this these people who are on the periphery of homelessness but not quite there yet um louise is there an issue as well with people being homeless because they just can't get the bank loan loan that they need to get on the ladder um are you dealing at brick with those sorts of people people who are just for them, buying a home and being in a home is not financially viable at all just because of the restrictions they face um, at the bank and elsewhere. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, the, the people that we're working with, to, honestly speaking, that's not even part of their aspiration. Do you know what I mean? It's not even something that they think can be attainable, um, which I think is, is really sad because we all should have that dream of owning our own home one day or or having a, a long-term place that we can call home. And, and they don't even have those aspirations. Their aspirations are, you know, what am I gonna do tonight? Um, and they're not thinking long-term. And I think if we can provide that stability to people with long-term, you know, long-term housing where they can, they can call it their forever home, um, people will start to have those aspirations. That's what they'll start doing. And I think it's really important that we make sure that um, just because somebody doesn't have those aspirations now, doesn't mean that they won't have them in the future once they've they've overcome the, these difficulties that they're currently facing. Another couple of questions just to follow up there briefly, um, Louise, is this idea of temporary housing versus permanent. Um, somebody here, I think um, Simon Gale is saying, actually, if you're in temporary accommodation, it can be even more negative to your mental health because it's still destabilizing, isn't it? You know, the idea of, well, you've got this accommodation for now, but where's the permanence? Is that also a problem that needs to be addressed? Permanent housing, where does it come from? Yeah, so I think um, with regards to like, you know, temporary housing, obviously if, you, if you're doing a sort of outreach and street-based outreach um, and you're doing it well, you always need some place that somebody can get into quickly. And I think that's where temporary housing has its place because you can get them off, you know, getting them into their, to their home could take days or weeks, their, you know, their housing first home. So I think it does have a place to put to, to be in, in, in this model. Um, I think what we need to do though is work quickly to getting people into housing first in that model very, very quickly so they can start their forever home um, journey. And so it does play. And I think what happens is if somebody's in the temporary accommodation too long, which you know, honestly speaking happens a lot because there's just nowhere for them to move to, people actually become dependent on that type of living. You know, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of, we will do this for you and we will do that. And then when you ask somebody to move into their forever home, you know, they, they are actually quite astounded by the responsibility that that has in, in, in taking their own, you know, paying their own bills and everything. So I think there's a very fine line between temporary, moving them from temporary to their own housing. And it's gotta be done very quickly, but very supported. Sally Ann, I'm going to give you this question as you're in Hastings and Rye, and this may be an issue that might be raised by constituents. It's a, it's a view, it's from Julian Pryor. How can an end to rough sleeping be achieved without a more joined up approach to helping migrants with no recourse to public funds to resolve their status in the UK and to integrate successfully or to return home if there is no right to remain legally and a safe route to return? Now, I mentioned that because, of course, there's been a hell of a lot of headlines in, in recent weeks about the migrant crisis, and we do hear stories don't we of seaside towns Kent and others in Kent and elsewhere saying look we, we cannot process these people because we've already got housing lists full of British citizens frankly um, where is this extra accommodation meant to come from and I know that's difficult a question to handle politically Sally Ann but as an MP how do you how do you respond to that? Um, it is a very difficult question um, well, I think, you know, when you're looking at, I, you know, I do get the odd constituent who's been on the housing list for a long time, who feels that why should they take second place to someone from London or from, you know, who have um, come here and claiming asylum. But I think, you know, as a country, we're incredibly tolerant and a very humane country. And so if people are here and they need support, we must give them that support, whether it's in temporary accommodation or in housing. And I think nobody would like to see people who come 
here, whether it's uh, whether they're legal immigrants or uh, claiming asylum, nobody wants to see them being treated in a way that we wouldn't treat um, British citizens, and that's absolutely vital. So I think when it comes to um, to that, we have to be humane about it. Um, but it is a question of having, uh, you know, I, I wrote an article, I completely back the Homes of the Heart campaign, which is a um, National Housing Federation campaign, to, to really look at building more social housing. So if we've got more social housing, so we talk about secure tenureship, social housing can be permanent. There are some people who would live in it forever, they need that safety net, and there are some who would use it as a springboard uh, into own, owning their own home. So I think, you know, I think Joe is right. There is a desperate need for more social housing. I mean, and that would actually scoop up everybody. <laughs> just to use a statistic on that before hopefully the Secretary of State joins us. Um, interestingly, regardless of what her subsequent legacy is, Margaret Thatcher, in her first five years in office, built 250,000 social homes. Now, we're all familiar with her introduction of people's right to buy their council homes. But 250,000 in the first five years, uh, so from 79 to 84, versus in the last 12 years, 20 to 30,000. Um, Mr. Jenrick's with us now, so hopefully you might have heard that question. What's the solution to that, Secretary of State? Because we've all been talking about this need to house the homeless. And it seems to all of us that bricks and mortar is what's needed. Um, so how can you respond to that from the government's perspective? And thank you for joining us. Hi, Camilla, I'm sorry, apologies for joining late. Uh, well, I think I got the gist of that question, and I agree with you entirely that we need to build more homes. We need to build more homes of all types and tenures. That means homes for ownership, which is what the Prime Minister was talking about in his speech earlier, but it also means homes of affordable rent and social rent as well. And at the times in the past where we've tackled this, including conservative governments like Harold Macmillan when he was housing minister, they were also building council housing and affordable rented homes as well as, as those for market sale. We're going to be doing this a number of different ways. We want to help it make it easier for people to get on the housing ladder. The PM has set out one of our flagship policies there through uh, a long term fixed rate mortgages. But we also want to push councils and housing associations now to get going and get building. And that's also incredibly important for the economy because that's one of the key counter cyclical things we can do to create and sustain jobs. We've set out a £12 billion affordable homes programme. And in that, I included a much larger share for socially rented homes than those created by my predecessors as Conservative uh, housing ministers. And that will build up to 180,000 new homes. I would like us to go further than that. And I think if we could bring together affordable or socially rented homes with say modern methods of construction, which also is so good for skills and the economy, then we could create more opportunities to build even more of these homes in the years ahead. We have quite a big investment already in housing as a government. Obviously, I'd like to persuade the Chancellor to give us uh, even more. But I'm trying to bring all of that forward so that we can use all the, the, the levers and the power of the state to get building now and sustain the hundreds of thousands of jobs that depend on the industry and build as many homes in this parliament as we possibly can. Do you have a number that you're trying to attain? I know the government has fallen foul at time of setting targets that it can't necessarily reach. We know you've got this target of ending rough sleeping by 2024. Can you put a number on how many homes you would ideally like to be building over the course of the next three or four years? Absolutely. We, say, we gave ourselves a manifesto target of a million homes over the course of this parliament. As I say, last year we reached 240,000. This year I suspect we'll be lower than that because of COVID. That's meant that uh, construction work was paused on many sites for a couple of months. Uh, it also means there will be fewer starts and that will set us back in uh, the, the next year as well. So we'll need to really power forward if we're gonna meet that. And that's why I think we do need a boost in investment by the government in all types of housing. And we need the planning reforms that I've been bringing forward as well, both the longer term ones and the short term ones, like the ability to regenerate empty buildings, to turn shops into houses. We need those to get the private sector investing now to create the homes that we need in this parliament. 
Can I just bring Tim Waits in there um, from the construction perspective? Do you find that there is a lot of, um, it could be local nimbyist opposition all the way to administrative problems with house building projects? I think certainly you find on planning it can be a, a challenging environment uh, for, nevertheless, I mean, there was progress being made and I think these, when these new reforms bed in a bit, I think we'll see a good move forward on it. So we're very pro the work to loosen up planning from the government. And just further commenting on uh, Sir Jenry's comments, I, we are, and the industry, are absolutely ready and willing to go on this. And if there is a long-term commitment from the government and long-term funding, we can really gear the industry up to deliver substantial housing, uh, given that we know that we are going to be funded to do that. What we find more difficult is you go cyclical and you build up your teams and then suddenly you have to reduce your teams. But the, I think what's being talked about could prove to be a really fantastic and positive step forward as regards to the supply of housing for the whole country. Let's just move forward in terms of that commitment to 2024. Mr. Jenrick, presumably that, I think it was in the manifesto, wasn't it? And has subsequently been much repeated by Boris Johnson. Is that still the target, even though that may have been made more difficult in the post COVID era? I think the Office of Budget Responsibility suggested that there could be at a worst case scenario, 4 million unemployed, which will inevitably lead to more homelessness. Um, can it still happen? Yes, I believe it can. I think you're right to say that the task is going to be harder. Uh, there's going to be, unfortunately, uh, flow onto the streets, as always happens during economic downturns. And so that will make it more challenging. But I, I do think it's possible. We saw during the Everyone In programme that the government uh, organised and was delivered by councils and charities uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, the incredible uh, will and our ability to make things happen when we really uh, put our shoulder to the wheel. We got almost all rough sleepers off the streets down to uh, just about 2,000 individuals, but 90% of rough sleepers were offered safe accommodation, which is really the best, you know, the best test of our success, that somebody had actually offered them a safe and secure place to go. Um, we want now to build on that. It would be a huge missed opportunity. You know, I think one that we would be ashamed of ourselves for if we didn't then try to prevent as many of those people as possible from drifting back onto the streets. That's why we were able to secure more funding uh, for support services for councils. We've just given them a hundred million pounds of additional funding for this year alone to look after those people. And we're also now bringing forward 400 million pounds to buy 6,000 uh, units of move on accommodation. This is good quality accommodation with wraparound care so that those individuals can ultimately be housed in the sort of accommodation that we'd all want them to be. And that will be the biggest injection of that sort of accommodation since Sir George Young was housing minister in the early 90s and worked with charities like St Mungo's to start the clearing house and that idea of move on accommodation. There is a lot to do and I need to get my other cabinet colleagues to support me because I think that this isn't just a housing crisis, it's also a crisis of mental health and addiction. And there's also law enforcement issues as well. We've got to, uh, as well as trying to support people, we've got to take action against um, ag aggressive begging and gangs on the streets, uh, individuals coming to this country uh, to beg. So it's a, we, what we want to do is bring together health and home office but the most concerted and coherent effort on this that we've certainly done since we came to power in 2010, uh, if not a long time before that. Um, earlier, unfortunately, you missed, but I think you must be familiar with the CSJ's Housing First initiative. And I think that has borrowed some ideas from abroad. So I'm not sure whether you're familiar with um, the Finnish approach um, in Helsinki, that the way that they effectively provide the bricks and mortar first and the rest will follow, which was just something we were discussing just a little bit earlier on in this in webinar. Have you seen those examples and what do you think the UK could learn from them, um, Mr. Jenrick? I have, and they're very powerful. Uh, I mean, their track record speaks for itself. In some cases, up to 90% of people who go through the Housing First programme end up being able to sustain um, a, a rental in the, in the private rental sector and begin to rebuild their lives. We've done pilots in places like Birmingham. I visited um, uh, some myself earlier this year in Warsaw, and we'd like to continue that. That, that is the, the, the theory behind the 6,000 homes that we're now uh, making available in all parts of the country. They won't have to be, uh, we're not being sort of doctrinaire about exactly what happens in those homes, but they'll be housing first style interventions 
and we're actually providing the same if not more funding per unit than housing first costs so over 14 thousand pounds a year of support costs in addition to the housing so it is an expensive intervention but it's one of the few which is proven around the world to work and that's why we want to keep investing in it okay let's bring louise green in here because obviously louise you experienced um from the charitable sector end of things what happened when there was this kind of immediate locking down and um rough sleepers were the process was expedited um what changed what changed in that scenario to make things go quicker? Because I suppose onlookers see that and say, well, because of a global pandemic, you're able to rid the streets of rough sleepers. Why can't you do that with a degree of permanence? And Louise, I just wondered what different things happened in order to facilitate? Was it a case, um, there's a question here from Salim talking about this idea of people on erratic and inconsistent incomes failing to qualify for housing because they simply can't prove um, their status and indeed any financial stability whatsoever was that cut out of the equation what expedited the process Louise so obviously again speaking from the Wigan um, local authority and, and you know we do work really closely with the local authority so we've got this really positive relationship and I think that's really important and obviously the government um, with everyone in um, you know said that basically no matter what it costs we've got to get people in and they've got to get into their own rooms so working together you know we were able to do that and that did ex expedite it very very quickly obviously then what happens is as the money runs out because it, it inevitably does people are dropping off again um and and you're starting to see that where i think an injection of housing first coming in very quickly and picking that up would be a huge success um we we saw everybody in so there was no there was no different like did you qualify did you not qualify it was everyone in and like i said you know i mentioned before recognition has to be given that that was that was a huge like massive thing to do and very successful and you know really put other countries to shame um in the ability to do that so i i do have to give credit to that um again like i said there was no really differences between economic or um the 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 conditions on which they live in in that moment everything just you know work together obviously as as the, it starts to drop off we're starting to see the 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 gaps in the services again and um, joe i'll bring you in just to answer question answer a question by laura furness who makes this point about you know often crises happen and investigations are carried out and lessons are learned and unfortunately nothing changes she uses the example of a number of different schemes that have failed in the past you know um i think she's talking about um rough sleeping and people with multiple disadvantage so fulfilling lives meam how do we ensure learning is used so we don't recreate approaches that haven't worked and how do we bring in lived experience to provide these essential insights i mean this is your bread and butter at the csj joe yeah no that's a fantastic question i just i say very quickly first of all thank you to the secretary of state for joining us and for his personal commitment to this um to this issue i mean i think in a way it answers the question, you know, it's not a huge number of people that we are talking about here. Actually, you know, crisis estimate that about 16,500 individuals could really benefit from a, a housing first style intervention. Uh, you know, MHCLG will know from its own um, amazing data capture during the, the crisis of the numbers of people, the types of issues that we're dealing with. You know, really the way to drive this isn't about some scheme or some gimmick. I think ultimately it's the political will to sustain, you know, sustain um, the outcomes that you might get quite quickly through a short-term um, intervention, but actually to think about the longer term, the permanence that's needed to really start to turn around um, those very complex and acute challenges that we, we see with rough sleepers. And so I think absolutely essential to bring in, you know, people with lived experience. I think the CSJ, um, you know, we look to our alliance of small charities to try and learn constantly from, you know, what the front lines are seeing and, and how people are experiencing these issues. But I think to the Secretary of State's point, this is also a cross government issue. We need cabinet um, level uh, uh, input on this, whether that's from health or from the Home Office as well. I think that that's how you really um, see change through longer term. That's what we'd love to see um, from our perspective. 
Kim, I'll ask you this one, because there has been some talk about this in the past as well, and Antonia May Cross makes this point in one of her questions. What's the panel's opinion on pop-up solution, prefab shipping container style housing? I mean, from a construction uh, perspective, maybe you don't see that that's a viable option at all, or is there ways of making housing that is both quicker and cheaper, just in terms of some of the new produce available? I mean, we've all heard about sort of IKEA pop-up homes, right? Yes, I mean, well, I think the pop-ups, if they're, if they're the slightly low quality is somewhat implied by, the, by how you ask the question. I mean, they are, you can get really unsuitable pop-ups, no question about it. And so that uh, one doesn't like that. Nevertheless, the commitment to modern methods construction is, is incredibly important, both in terms of efficiency, uh, both in terms of quality of product, but also in terms of the workforce that we have in the UK. We need to, to be able to deliver homes to sites without necessarily employing lots and lots of people on those sites simply for capacity issues. So I think the commitment of the industry and very much led by the government to modern methods construction is absolutely there. And I think we'll find it's forming a big part of how we build uh, in the years ahead. And in fact, MMC is not just, a, you don't just build a house in the factory and pop it down. Often you find bits of a house are constructed with modern methods construction. So perhaps the entire boiler system is put in a box and then bolted on. So it's not as simple as just a whole big house. You find that the houses can be built in a modular way, part bit by bit. So very exciting area and an area certainly from the point of view of waste that we're very engaged with. Um, uh, Mr. Jenrick, I'm just going to bring in a few questions because they're all of the same theme and it's very much when you talked about the cabinet cooperation that's required and the joined up thinking between different government departments. It's reflected in some of these questions talking about the specific impact of people being in prison and then leaving and instantly becoming homeless. Um, one a person here using the example of one woman's prison actually giving prisoners sleeping bags when they leave their cell. Um, this issue of addiction and mental health and its correlation to homelessness, um, you missed that part of the conversation earlier. Can I just bring you in on those um, lifestyle elements, please? Absolutely. Well, I, as I said earlier, I, I think that homelessness is even probably even more of a crisis of addiction and mental health than it is about housing. And you know, if you spend time with homeless people, particularly more persistent, longer term rough sleepers, sadly, the majority, in some, you know, often the vast majority, have one or the other serious mental health issues or serious addiction problems. And so we've got to get the NHS and uh, the Department for Health to view this as the emergency that it is to be thinking very innovatively about the quality of care that they provide to people, including on the streets. You know, too often people are left neglected without that support who are sleeping rough. And then with respect to prisons, uh, there I am working very closely with Robert Buckland and Lucy Fraser, uh, the prisons minister and the Lord Chancellor, uh, on what we can do there. Because you're absolutely right, and the, the, the questioner was right, that still far too many prisons are leaving without settled accommodation. And that, all of the indications you know, show, the evidence is very clear, leads to inevitably committing more crime uh, or, or, or a life on the streets. And we've got to change that. So I'm hopeful that we will be able to make a significant intervention there. We need to be investing more as a country in the type of move on accommodation that we were talking about, supported housing, which is the, the accommodation that people can get into as their first step to rebuilding their lives. And I think, frankly, we haven't invested enough in that in recent years, and I'm hopeful we can change that. Are you still hopefully can change that in light of, you know, obviously cuts having been made to, to local services? And I suppose we can predict more of that. I know the Prime Minister has been very keen to avoid any talk of a return to so-called austerity, also keen to avoid any talk of a return to any tax cuts, while at the same time the Chancellor Rishi Sunak yesterday saying, well, look, you know, <laughs> there isn't the magic money tree that the Tories accused Jeremy Corbyn of planting. So financially, how viable is it going to be to find some of these solutions, not least at a local authority level, when they already claim to be extremely cash strapped? Well, housing is a priority for the government. And you know, I'm pleased to say that now in the sort of lexicon of the Prime Minister, of the 40 new hospitals, the extra police officers, you know, the nurses, uh, a million new homes is now very much part of that. And the Prime Minister's speech just now um, put housing right up there as one of the, the top two or three issues that are the mission of the government. So that, for me, is a big success. I'm pleased that it's really at the heart of 
of policy making. Uh, in terms of money for rough sleeping, you know, actually, we are now spending a lot of money as a government. We will spend a billion pounds on trying to tackle rough sleeping in this spending period. That, that's a lot of money. Um, so, of course, you could always spend more. Um, but the issue to me is more about delivery now. And the best thing that I can do to secure more money in the future is to demonstrate that these interventions are actually working and that we are able to take that cohort of people that we took off the streets to everyone in and ensure that as few of them as possible end up back on the streets and we can evidence that they move into the new homes that we're uh, supplying and they begin to, to turn their lives around. And that's the task that I'm now working with local councils and charities on across the country. We asked every local council uh, to prepare a plan. We're now financing those plans so they should have the money that they need, certainly for this financial year and hopefully beyond that. Um, they'll have their portion of the 6,000 homes We'll be announcing that in the next couple of weeks. And so the resources, I think, are there, certainly in the medium term. We collectively, and I don't think this is an easy challenge, but we've now got to, to show results. And that's the way that I will be able to make the case to the Chancellor and the Prime Minister in the future that we are getting there, helping to turn people's lives around. And the idea, you know, this is the dream of eradicating rough sleeping can be a reality. Would you say, because a question is asked this, so I'll channel their question to you, that we're in the midst of a housing crisis? I mean, in the sense that, and I know the Tories have blamed successive um, Labour governments for not building enough, and yet people can point to the last 10 years, um, you know, of coalition or Tory leadership and say that still that hasn't been improved upon. Are we at crisis point? I, I mean, I'm always hesitant about saying everything is a crisis because... You know, we, we, we call everything a crisis these days, but I think objectively, this is a very serious situation. You know, on many different measures, there are far too many people on local authority waiting lists for houses. There have been far too many people sleeping rough on the streets. It is much more difficult than a generation ago for young people to get on the housing ladder. There are too many families living in temporary accommodation. So on numerous levels, and right, we could, we could say more, this is a very serious situation which demands radical action. I, I believe that's what we're doing. And I hope that all those people who share that conviction will support some of the reforms that we're taking forward, like the planning reforms, for example, because these things are contentious and difficult and you know, they will not make everybody feel comfortable, but they are together the way to help to turn the tide and to tackle this issue and set up a much better system for the future. On that, I think I was going to turn to the panel just for final questions about the public response. And you raise an issue there. Of course, it's difficult. It's also difficult for a Conservative government associated, I suppose, historically with a degree of nimbyism, having to be yimby. Um, there was recently um, some suggestion about sort of concreting over huge swathes of the home counties. Does the general public, if they want to support rough sleepers into housing, have to give up a bit on this not in my backyard attitude? I mean, is that part of the solution here? I think if you care about this issue, then you've got to um, show a bit of give and take, haven't you? You've got to, if you want your children and grandchildren to get on the housing ladder, if you want to help people who are vulnerable into safe and secure homes, then we've all got to accept that more homes are going to be built in all parts of the country. We're going to do that as sensitively as we possibly can. We're putting design and quality and environmental standards on a, a higher uh, footing, a stronger footing than I think we've ever seen before. And there's more that we can do in that respect. But we've got to accept that there is a fundamental issue of supply here. We need to be building more homes of all types and tenures in all parts of the country, whether that's in you know, the most beautiful parts of the Cotswolds or Surrey, or whether it means urban regeneration and renewal in our core cities. We've all got to play our part in this. I appreciate that's difficult and housing, you know, is such a, it's such an emotional subject. If someone puts in a planning application to build opposite your own house, you know, inevitably, this is your biggest asset. This is the thing, this is your pride and joy. Um, I appreciate that, I understand that. And that's inherently conservative for us to want to protect and preserve the things around us. Uh, but we have to recognize that this is about laying the foundations for the future of the country. And also conservatives have tended to prosper when they've built homes, whether that was Harold Macmillan um, or Margaret Thatcher. Home ownership is a conservative thing and we have to be behind it. And it's ultimately the way we safeguard and protect the future of conservatism in the country. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Louise, I just bring you in there because often the public doesn't know what to do when it comes to seeing rough sleepers. Should they give them money? Should they not? Should they give money to a charity like yours, Brick? What can the public do to help this? Um, thanks, Camilla. I think um, that's a really tough answer, a, a tough question, isn't it? Because there's so many different points of views on, on how we can support people. Um, me personally, and the ethos of, of the charity is we tend to, to say to people that, you know, giving somebody, giving somebody cash directly isn't actually beneficial. Um, it's, you know, we, we want to support people. We, we think that people um, deserve more than that pound that you give them. And the other thing, I guess, to reflect on is when you walk away from that person, uh, who actually feels better? Um, you were the person that you gave the pound to. So, and I think that needs to be considered. So from our point of view, we would say that, you know, you should give to a, a local charity or even a national charity, you know, to any charity, if you give that money. I also th think that um, there's, a, there's a confusion around um, aggressive begging um, with homelessness as well. And I think those are, you know, to, to Joe Public, they're very easy to, to be one and the same when, when they're actually not. So there's a lot of provision out there right now, obviously with, with, with what's happened with, um, this provision that that's been put in place. So if you see somebody begging, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're homeless, and that actually could be a lifestyle choice. Um, and yeah, so I would say give to the local charity. Before I hand over to Sally Ann and Tim and Joe, just for some final thoughts, Laura has clarified, and I need to clarify this because I don't want to sully any projects that have been successful. MEAM and Fulfilling Lives are successful programs, not ones which didn't work. We addressed this question earlier when we spoke to Joe about how do we um, avoid um, repeating mistakes. So I just wanted to clarify that if anyone's watching who is involved in either of those two successful programs. Um, Sally Ann. What responsibility do MPs have, not least to ensure on a local level that the government, even if it's your own government, is fulfilling some of these, um, albeit admirable, but also lofty ambitions that um, Mr. Jenrick has, has, has explained today? Well, I think, you know, um, supporting our government is the most important thing. And, you know, we all as Conservatives want to support home ownership, but we do have to have that safety net, which is the social housing aspect. And I think um, all I can do is, is keep lobbying about the wraparound care for people with multiple complex needs, but also speak to your local authority and find out what the issues are. I mean, look, listening to Louise there about not giving money to people who are homeless and begging on the streets, I think there is an issue that we need to look at in terms of charities who are providing sleeping bags and food, because in many ways they're facilitating homelessness, whereas we want um, charities like the Brick that actually get people off the streets and work with them and help with the issues, the underlying issues that um, are causing their homelessness. Um, that's something we've really got to focus on. So yes, I think we need to, to look at the whole thing of rough sleeping homelessness in a holistic way and how we actually get to the root cause of it. Thank you. And Tim, is the construction industry able to compete with the demand of a million houses? Yes, I mean, I think we're uh, without question really, really up for that. And as I said, it's all about uh, having the long term funding in place so we have confidence and build our teams and keep them there for the long, for the long term. And also, just listening to this debate, you see how complex this um, housing homelessness issue is. And I'm so pleased to hear Secretary of State acknowledging that. And also, on the whole context of more housing in the UK, I think it's great. There's, they have to face the fact that some of the measures you take are unpopular. We've just got to be brave, be consistent and stick at it. And Joe, as it's a CSJ event, let's have you make the concluding remarks. There's a few questions here that I haven't been able to cover all of them, but I hope I've covered as many as uh, I possibly can in this session. People talking about the idea that perhaps the solution isn't always bricks and mortar for some people who are homeless. They don't necessarily want that kind of accommodation. They need a different pathway. Maybe they also need help, somebody's pointed out here, with the um, benefits that they've been reduced too much, that they haven't got those solutions. So perhaps we don't want to oversimplify this situation, do we, by saying that it's all about a roof over the head. It, it's about a lot more than that, isn't it? The solution as we go back to conclude to the next step to ending rough sleeping, more, more than just bricks and mortar, Joe? Yeah, totally. I think it, it, it's, a, you know, it's a temptation to look through the lens of housing um, when we're thinking about rough sleeping but um, and I'll give a, a bit of a plug to some some work that's been done another CSJ team um, on uh, what was originally meant to be a sort of twin track to universal credit as it was rolled out 
uh, was a program called Universal Support. And this really kind of goes to the point about, let's think about this individual and what their, what their needs are. It might not necessarily be a housing need that's the issue when, when, when thinking about their rough sleeping. It might be more to do with, uh, with the mental health issue. It might be a family problem. It might be a debt issue or an addiction problem. And so we're really keen to see the government rediscover universal support as a really important part of those reforms. And I think, you know, looking at the success of um, the, the ministry's um, Troubled Families Programme, taking a lot of the learning from that and how you approach um, someone who's really struggling, uh, yeah, taking, taking universal support forward um, at, at the spending review would be a really fantastic thing to do. And we'd love to um, have follow up conversations on that if possible. Well, I think plenty of follow-up conversations are going to be needed. This has been really informative. Thank you, everybody, for taking part. Tim, Louise, sally Ann, Joe, and to Secretary of State Robert Jenrick. Thank you for your time, which I know is in a busy week and not least a busy day with the boss on stage. Um, thank you, everyone, for watching, for submitting your questions, um, and thank you to the CSJ, finally, for, for hosting this webinar.